thank you for that introduction, Red. Um, and thank you. It was very sweet that you say that I'm not quite a super villain yet, that, that I'm on my way. Because not only am I an atheist, which most people think is uh, evil, I'm also a virologist. And as most of you know, if you are a movie writer who wants to bring about the end of mankind, you've got three options, really. You've got an asteroid, you've got aliens, or you've got viruses. Um, and I study these guys every day. And you know, most of these movies are about scientists, even well-meaning scientists, not even the supervillain kind, that are trying to do something wonderful and they end up uh, bringing about you know, the end of humanity. So people are terrified of viruses to the point where uh, recently the CDC actually had to release an official statement that there isn't a virus going around turning people into zombies, um, which almost makes people even like less trustworthy of the message because if you've got an official government agency saying that there's no such thing as viruses that cause zombies, um, that makes them distrust it even more. Uh, but the thing is, you know, as a virologist, um, I don't think there's much of a point in, you know, inventing these scary viruses or inventing a virus uh, that causes zombies because we've got very real scary viruses on this planet. Um, they paralyze us, they scar us for life, they blind us, they kill us. Um, and, you know, the thing that makes viruses so scary to me, you know, more than like an asteroid uh, would be terrifying, is that viruses, you can't see them, you can't taste them, you can't smell them, you can't avoid them, there's, there's nothing you can really do about becoming infected. And you get infected with a virus from your parents, from your kids, from uh, your loved ones, from your friends, from people you've never even met or seen before. Uh, and they can infect you with a virus that can kill you in a matter of weeks, it can kill you in a matter of months. With HIV, it might kill you in years. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but your ancestors were infected with a virus, you know, maybe tens of thousands of years ago, that could kill you today. Uh, seriously, an infection that happened that long ago could actually kill you today. So I fully understand why people are afraid of viruses. And I totally understand why individuals might not always necessarily trust what us crazy scientists are doing in the laboratory. Uh, because, you know, just very recently, I'm sure some of you might have heard of this, scientists have created this super killer flu. Why would we do that? Like, what, what would possess us to do something this absurd? Well, uh, in my talk today, I want to kind of explain to you all what viruses are and what I use them for in the lab, what other scientists use them for in the lab that actually help you. Um, the vast, vast, vast majority of viruses on this planet couldn't care less about humans. If humans really were eliminated tomorrow from a super virus, most viruses just would keep on trucking. They don't care. But we can use these other viruses as tools to make the world a better place. So to start with, I just want to explain to you all what a virus is. <laughs> this is my super uh, elegant, scientifically drawn diagram. So a virus is basically this protein core that can come in lots of different shapes. You, you see it like this, but there are infinite number of shapes viruses can come in. And this protein core contains the virus's genome. Now humans, we have double-stranded DNA that gets translated or uh, turned into RNA, which gets translated into proteins that build us. Viruses, on the other hand, they come in DNA, they come in RNA, they come in double-stranded, they come in single-stranded, they come in haploid and diploid and segments. Um, any kind of combination of permutation you can think of, viruses use that to their advantage. And that's really that's what a virus is. Um, occasionally, viruses have other bells and whistles, other accessory proteins. Some of them have a membrane on the outside that looks like our cell membranes uh, to help kind of hide from the immune system. And some have other proteins that help it interact and infect our cells better. This is a slightly better uh, artistic rendition uh, from the CDC of influenza. 
might be a little hard to see here, but it's basically the same where you've got this protein core that contains a virus and uh, these proteins on the outside that interact with our cells to initiate an infection. That's not really what viruses look like either. Viruses are super, super teeny tiny, so tiny that on this huge screen, I'm sure like none of you can see this, um, this is one cell and there are these teeny tiny white dots on here that are a virus, um, in this case influenza. And the exact same influenza virus can have very different morphology uh, just depending on its genetic code. So the same virus can be uh, very different, have different disease progressions, different everything. Viruses are very different. But functionally, what viruses are, are little wads of protein and fat and sugar that exist to replicate. They only want to reproduce. Does that sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> but what we're focused on here. So viruses, they're okay. They're kind of like us. There's no reason. Um, they aren't as alien as some of us uh, look at them as. So reason number one that you should not be afraid of viruses is that it's pointless. They are everywhere. There is no place on planet Earth you can go to be totally free of viruses. So one example, there is a lake in Antarctica that is like uh, the Dead Sea where the ocean used to be there and then the ocean receded and you're left with this very shallow uh, pool lake and water evaporates and it just, it becomes more and more saline. Um, so this is a hyper saline lake and because of that, the temperature of the water can get all the way down to negative 20 degrees. It doesn't freeze uh, like you know, regular water would. And it's got the highest concentration of sulfur of any natural body of water. Guess what? You can find viruses there. And not only can you find viruses in that you know, we would think uninhabitable, uh, you know, not conducive to life, uh, you can find viruses that infect other viruses. They're called virophages um, in this you know, insane environment. Okay, so you aren't safe in, in a cold climate. What about hot? So we have uh, these thermal vents. Um, anytime that you think, you know, like Yellowstone Park, you've got these pools of boiling acid. Uh, 72 to 90 degrees, pH down to <coughs> 1. Boiling bath acid. Nothing can live there, right? No, there's viruses there, and we actually right here in Yellowstone Park in the United States. Go to Yellowstone, you can find viruses in those pools there. So nowhere hot, nowhere cold. What does this mean in the parts of the world that are more normal? Well, if you go to the ocean, and scoop up, you know, just a Pepsi bottle uh, worth of ocean water. In that bottle, you're gonna have four to 400 billion viruses. What does that mean if you're looking at the ocean in its entirety? If you took all of the carbon from those viruses, you could build about 75 million blue whales. There are a lot of viruses in the ocean. <laughs> They're everywhere. And so you're thinking, you know, maybe viruses make us sick. Then why don't we get sick every time we swim in the ocean? Why, why are these viruses not infecting us? Like I said before, these viruses don't care about you. Most of these viruses want to infect uh, bacteria and algae, and they're bopping along just fine, don't care about humans. That doesn't mean that we can't capitalize on them because uh, there's an individual named Craig Venter that some of you might have heard of. He was part of the Human Genome Project. He's sailing about the world in his yacht, scooping up water, sequencing everything in it. Scooping up water, sequencing everything in it. And what he's finding are all of these novel genes, these novel enzymes, um, these novel processes that we never knew existed before because we're focused on the viruses that make us sick. We're not looking at, our, at all of the other viruses that exist on this planet. And so, long story short, what he's saying is that you know we might be able to capitalize on the evolutionary history of viruses to address some of our environmental problems that we have today, you know, from global warming, from the waste we're dumping into the oceans and that sort of thing. So yes, there are lots of viruses. There's no place you can go. Maybe you are uh, 
extreme germaphobe hypochondriac, and you're like, fine, I can't be anywhere on Earth to escape viruses, so I'm going to sterilize a spaceship and go to Mars, and I'll be safe there. And you're not. <laughs> Bad news, you're a virus. There, there's literally no place you can go. <laughs> um, so, when a mommy and daddy love each other very much, <laughs> And uh, there's an egg and a sperm, and, and you have one set of DNA from mom and one set of DNA from dad, and it comes together and forms a uh, combination of mom and dad, which is the baby. Okay. Well, on occasion, daddy is infected with a retrovirus, and uh, by accident, the retrovirus does not want to do this. This is totally a mistake. A retrovirus will infect either an egg or a sperm. Now, retroviruses, uh, you know how I said viruses come in lots of different flavors and colors of genome. Retroviruses carry their genome as RNA. They turn it into DNA, and then they integrate it into our DNA. So it becomes a permanent part of us. So if a retrovirus is a permanent part of sperm, that goes on to create offspring, that virus is a permanent part of that offspring's DNA. Now, this is called an endogenous retrovirus. It is a very rare event because, like I said, it's an accident. A, a retrovirus that is infected in A can't go on to produce more viruses, and that's, that's, what, that's the end goal of a virus. Um, and then on top of that, you know, you can cause lots of trouble if you just randomly insert a virus into somebody's genome. But when you have these very rare events and you're dealing with a 4.2 billion year time frame, random events happen all the time to the tune where 9% of your genome is unquestionably viral. Yeah. You, 9% of you is virus. Another 44% is just parasitic DNA. You would not exist. Anyone in this room would not exist if it were not for retroviruses and this endogenous retroviral uh, phenomenon because the human placenta, or any mammal's placenta really, uh, the barrier between the fetus and mom, there is this multi-nucleated block. So most cells, you've got a cell and then a nucleus, like the brain of a cell. Well, this blob is a huge cell that's got lots and lots and lots of nuclei in it. And at this uh, junction is where the fetus gives off its waste and mom pumps in oxygen and nutrients. <laughs> Turns out that retroviruses perform that exact same trick. They turn cells into these multinucleated blobs. And it's just on accident. Um, if you've got two target cells for a virus, one cell is infected, it uh, puts on the surface the virus's protein that it needs when it buds off to infect more cells. Well, that exact same protein, if it snuggles up next to another uh, cell that can become infected, causes them to fuse together, and you get these, after fusion, it's called syncytia. Syncytia looks awfully a lot like these syncytial trophoblasts that happen from a human placenta, and in fact, we, our genome domesticated an endogenous retrovirus for the formation of placentas. No mammal would exist without these retroviral insertions. So this is uh, an example of a natural domestication. We took a wild virus and we turned it into something we could use. We took a wild wolf and turned it into, you know, a house container for us. We also do this uh, artificially. So, uh, a really good example that you guys are probably already familiar with are vaccines. So, vaccines, you inject them into you guys, you snort them, you swallow them, and they are either parts of dead viruses or bacteria, um, killed viruses or bacteria, or you might have heard the phrase, an attenuated virus. This is a domesticated virus. So normally, if you're exposed to, for example, a wild influenza virus, it gets into your bloodstream, it makes you really sick, um, but your immune system eventually learns how to fight off that virus and you get better. 
Well, what we've done for an attenuated virus, a domesticated virus, is we start with a virus that's really good at replicating in people, and we put it in chicken eggs. And the virus is like, what's going on? This is not a people, this is chicken, this is uncomfortable for me. Um, but because viruses only want to reproduce, it does as best as it can in the chicken egg. And so you take those viruses that are produced and you put them in chicken eggs again. And it's like, okay, you know, this isn't so bad, I can handle this. And you do it over and over and over until you get a virus that's really good at replicating in chicken eggs. It loves chicken eggs. And then what happens when you take that virus and you put it into humans, it's like, what's going on? Like, this, this is not my nice, warm, comfy chicken egg. This is a human. So it's called attenuated. It doesn't replicate well in humans anymore, which means your immune system has a really easy time fighting it off, and you can build protection against the wild-type virus without ever having to get sick. You get the shot. You never have to worry about the side effects or worry about dying or worry about going blind or anything like that because a domesticated virus taught your immune system how to fight the bad guy. And we have a whole list of these guys that we've used. The, the infamous MMR vaccine. Um, those are live viruses that gave their lives to protect yours. Um, <laughs> Chickenpox, oral polio, the influenza when you snort, um, a couple of them that you guys hopefully won't have to get the yellow fever or rabies vaccine. Um, we've got oral formulations now. And these attenuated vaccines are actually the best ones because you, you have very low levels of infection, very weak infection, but you get the best immune response. You get a better immune response than if you injected a dead virus or uh, just parts of a virus. So these guys are absolutely great. It's like, why, why are you gonna be afraid of a domesticated virus any more than you would be afraid of you know, a bomb sniffing dog? It's not a wild wolf that's gonna come meet you. Okay, now we're getting into the awesome stuff that I'm sure you guys haven't heard of. Um, viruses are making our lives better in such an awesome way. Um, an example, a uh, normal vision. Your eyes are like a constantly renewing piece of Polaroid film. So let's say you get up in the morning, read the paper, have some orange juice, you go on a bike ride, uh, you go on a little nature walk, and then in the, the day, you know, you enjoy a pretty sunset. Okay. There are kids with a disease called LCA. And the reason, the reason why your eyes are like a continually renewing piece of Polaroid film is because you've got this recycling process going on. And some of the kids with LCA uh, can't do the recycling because one of, one of the genes has a mutation in it. So one of the enzymes doesn't work anymore, so it can't, it can't recycle, it can't renew its Polaroid film. <laughs> so they get up in the morning, have uh, orange juice, read the paper, and then they go on a bike ride, and then they go on a nature walk. Like, it's, it's an overexposed piece of film. Well, we've got a gene that's non-functional, and we've got viruses whose sole purpose is to deliver genes, to make more viruses in that case, but to deliver genes. What if we put a functional copy of that gene into a virus and have the virus deliver a functional copy of the gene? That'd be kind of neat. Um, and so that's what some scientists have, had, have thought about. So they found a virus that can infect the retina. They genetically modified the virus so it doesn't make you sick. They genetically modify the virus to deliver a functional copy of this gene. They modify the gene so it expresses properly. And then they infect the eyes of kids with this disease. Um, your eyes are immune privileged, so you don't have to worry about immune response. Let's cure blind kids, right? Well, oh, you can't see this at all. That's Julian Bashir from uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Um, if, if you don't know, he got gene therapy when he was a kid. And I was gonna say that, you know, this isn't, this isn't science fiction. We have been curing blind kids with LCA, with viruses for like years now. This already happened. Not science fiction. In the lab, there are little eight-year-old boys running around 
who used to be blind that can now be little eight-year-old hooligans. Um, oops. Thanks to viruses. Um, and, and we're to the point now where uh, any, ge any genetic disease that's caused by a, a malfunction in one gene, we kind of know what to do with it now. It's just a matter of uh, optimizing it, making it better, make the response last longer. Um, especially this hemophilia B. These were individuals that had to go into a clinic like three times a week for intravenous uh, treatment for their disease. After they were treated with viruses that delivered a functional copy of whatever gene they needed, totally off therapy. Uh, one of the guys ended up being a marathon runner who like, never has to deal with his hemophilia B ever again. You go from needing to be in a clinic three times a week to never thanks to viruses. Um, that's awesome. But a lot of us in this room you know, at this point, we don't really have a genetic disease that you know this would help us out. Oh yeah, we've got we've got options for all of us in this room. Another example, uh, metastasized melanoma. If you get a stage four diagnosis, 75% um, chance you're going to be dead in a year. Uh, the treatment options for metastasized melanoma haven't really changed since the 1970s, and it's not from the people not trying, it's just we haven't found anything that works any better than what we had back then. An obvious solution to this problem is, of course, herpes. <laughs> <laughs> What they did, what scientists did, was they gutted out the bad stuff from herpes. They got it addicted to a protein that's really upregulated in tumors. Um, they gave it some like bonus uh, immune stimulating uh, genes, and they injected it straight into some of these tumors. These individuals in this trial, 50 patients, when, when you're in a trial like this, <laughs> you're really at the end of your options. This is end of the road, Hail Mary pass. At the end of this study, 13 of those 50 patients had no, ev no evidence of disease. They went from, <laughs> I'm gonna be dead in a year, to no evidence of disease. One of the patients in particular apparently had a lesion on her shoulder. It had spread uh, across her back. Uh, she had lesions in her lungs. She had lesions in her liver. All gone. Um, so the one year, overall one year survival went from 26% to 58%, two years from 10 to 20% up to 52%. These individuals had no options and herpes saved them. <laughs> so the reason why we can do stuff like this is because uh, scientists, virologists were nuts. Um, and we think about putting things together from, from different parts uh, of, our, of our knowledge to do something really weird like this. So when you read a study that says scientists have created this super killer flu, try to think of it from the evil scientist perspective. Like what, what would we genuinely be trying to do with this other than making a super deadly virus just because we can? Well, Bird flu. Bird flu uh, is different from people flu because very simplistically, uh, bird flu likes the sugar on bird cells and people flu likes the sugar on people cells. Um, but on occasion, there are individuals, uh, usually in Southeast Asia, who live in extreme poverty, um, who live with their livestock. They live <coughs> with their geese and their chickens and their ducks. Um, so very rarely, they can become infected with a bird flu. So a human is infected with a bird flu. And it has had like huge mortality. 50 to 60% of the individuals who have been infected with bird flu have died. Um, but at this point, it can't be transmitted from human to human. We're dealing with influenza, which is an RNA virus, which mutates a lot. Even you guys know that. That's why you have to get a new shot every year, is because influenza changes and the vaccine you got last year won't work anymore. 
So we've already got this little hotbed of bird to human uh, transitions and infections. What does it take to turn that bird to human into a human to human transmittable virus? None of us in here have any kind of protection against bird flu because none of us have been infected with it. So what scientists did was they tried to get ahead of nature. They took the influenza virus and they did exactly what we did with chicken eggs, except we put it into ferrets, ferrets are the animal model for influenza. And they figured out what a virus would look like that could be transmitted from ferret to ferret, from human to human. So this is this killer, killer flu that pop media was talking about was a domesticated virus. This virus is going to evolve at some point in nature. But what we did was artificially evolve it in the lab before nature did it. So we are to the point where we could make a vaccine to a virus that doesn't even exist in nature. Like, imagine what that would mean if we knew about HIV before the HIV epidemic started. If we knew how it was transmitted, if we knew how to make an effective vaccine, we wouldn't even know about the HIV pandemic. What these scientists are saying is if we understand killer bird flu in the lab before killer bird flu is out in nature, we can prevent, you know, another 1918 influenza crisis. Stop worrying, people. Just stop. Viruses are cool. Like, we're, we're, we're doing stuff in the lab to help make everybody's lives better. We are not insane people who are going to turn people into zombies. I don't even know how we would do that. Um, think about it, I know. If we really focused, I bet we could do it. We work together. Um, but seriously, like, stop worrying. It's like, embrace who you are as a virus and embrace the world that we live in, which is viral. And, and, and use it to your advantage. Don't be afraid of it.